You know how you can sometimes have those experiences in life that just sort of stay with you? I mean, time passes, life goes on, and you grow older, but you just never quite forget the experience. Now, sometimes those are dramatic things, things that are heart-wrenching and, and even painful things that come along, but sometimes they're just experiences, just experiences, but they stay with you. It was a long time ago now, a long time ago, but I, I remember I had one of those experiences when I was just a little guy, about eight or nine years of age. My parents and I were on vacation. We had traveled up the East Coast and, and spent some time in New York City, and then we crossed over the border into Canada and spent some time there before coming back through the Midwest and driving back on home down into Florida. And, and one of the places that we stopped along the way was Niagara Falls. Uh, my mother had never been to Niagara Falls. She always wanted to go to Niagara Falls, and so we stopped at Niagara Falls. And, and I can remember that experience as if it happened yesterday. We were standing at the top of what I think they call the Horseshoe Falls, and, and we were just watching as the water tumbled over, over the edge and fell crashing into the little Niagara River below. Now, geologist or meteorologist or marine biologist or whoever it is that measures such things tells us that every minute something like six million cubic feet of water go over the edge of, of those falls and fall 188 feet before colliding with with the water below. And to this day, I can, I can still remember standing there and watching the mist as it rose up from the water below. And, and I can still remember hearing that thunderous noise of, of the falls so loud that you almost couldn't hear the people next to you speak unless they spoke up just a, a little bit. And I can still remember feeling the ground beneath my feet shake with, with all of that immense activity going on all around. To tell you the truth, it was just a little bit intimidating. And in that regard, my father wasn't much help. We were standing right at the edge of, of the river as it raced by, and, and the falls were only about 50 yards or so away from us before, before they, they tumbled over. And the only thing that was separating us from that water as it raced by was one of those railings, you know, the kind that have like two bars on them. There's, there's one about waist high, and then there's another bar that, that's just a little bit lower for kids. And at one point as we were standing there, my, my father spoke up, spoke loud enough so I could hear him. And he said, boy, you sure wouldn't want to fall in there. You fall in there and you're a goner. And until that moment, I hadn't thought about the possibility that I could actually fall into that water. But since my father said it, I couldn't think of anything else. My eyes grew as big as saucers, and I started backing up just a little bit. And all of a sudden, my father put his hand around my back and pressed gently. And he said, son, don't, don't be afraid. I've got you. I've got you. Now that was more than 50 years ago. But I still remember, as I say, as if it were yesterday. And what I remember most about that experience is, is just a couple of things. I remember the feeling I had in that force of nature. I, I had the feeling that I was in the presence of a power that was bigger and greater and more grander than I would ever be. And I remember that my father had a hold of me the whole time, the whole time. Well, as we've already talked about a couple of times today, today is Pentecost Sunday, and one of the things that continues to live in the memory of the church is what took place on that very first Pentecost Sunday all those centuries ago when God poured out God's Spirit and the church was born. 
It all began, so says the beloved physician, St. Luke. And, and you remember that the beloved physician, St. Luke, was the author of the Acts of the Apostles. It all began, he said, when the disciples were all together in one place. Ten days earlier, Jesus had ascended to the Father. However, if you were here last Sunday when we began our sermon series on followers, then, then you know that right before Jesus ascended to the Father, he had a word for the disciples. He turned to them and he said, wait, wait for the promise of the Father and, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And when you do, power will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so you remember the disciples wanting to operate not just on their own agenda but on God's agenda operating not just on Kronos time but on what we learned last week Kairos time they waited they waited for the promise to be fulfilled they waited 10 days they waited in one place they waited all together and suddenly the thing that Jesus had predicted began to happen now actually Jesus was neither the first nor the only one to look forward to that day, to predict it. Centuries earlier, the prophet Joel had looked forward to that day. He had looked forward to that day when God would pour out God's Spirit and, and the young would see visions and the old would dream dreams. Three years earlier, John the Baptist had anticipated that day. At the time, John the Baptist was at the very height of his popularity, and Jesus had yet to emerge in the, in the public eye, and so I suppose it was only natural that people would begin to wonder, is John the Baptist the one that we've been waiting for? Is John the Baptist the long-awaited Messiah? And you remember word filtered back to John the Baptist what people were saying. And so in response he said, listen, I'm baptizing you with water. But there is one who is coming who is greater than I am. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire, with fire. So suddenly the thing that the prophet Joel had looked forward to, the thing that John the Baptist had anticipated, the thing that Jesus predicted began to happen. And Luke says this is the way it happened. First of all, there was a sound like a howling, fierce wind. It was the way they put it in the translation that we read this morning. Other translations say it was like the rush of a mighty wind. Other translations call it a violent wind. Think in terms of, uh, of what you might hear if you were in a hurricane or if you were in a tornado. Think of that sound, and, and that's probably a, a pretty close call. And next he said, they saw what appeared to be flames of fire resting on each of them. Now that's something you don't see every day. And Luke's use here of the images of wind and flame are, are, are very significant. He wants for us to call to mind a couple of very important things. He wants us to call for, to mind, for example, that moment right before the dawn of creation. That moment before anything that is, was. That moment before there were people like you and me. That moment before there were any living creatures. That moment before there were any birds of the air, fish of the sea, any plant life, any vegetation life. That moment before there was even a sun or a moon or stars or the planet Earth. That moment when everything, I mean everything, is what Genesis describes as a formless void, a formless void. But then you remember, the book of Genesis says, the wind, the ruach, the wind of God began to move. And creation sprang forth. On the day of Pentecost, Luke says, there was a sound like the rush of a mighty wind. He also wants us to call to mind that time when 
God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai and gave to him the Ten Commandments. You, you, you remember when God appeared to Moses on, uh, on Mount Sinai and gave to him the Ten Commandments, all of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke and there was lightning and thunder of all kinds. And as you continue to read through the book of Exodus into the 24th chapter, the writer of Exodus tells us to the Israelites, to the Israelites, the glorious presence of God looked like a blazing fire. Luke wants us to call to mind these things. Why? What is it that Luke wants us to see? Well, you take these images and then you also put them in the context of the rest of what happened that day on the day of Pentecost, what we read a little bit earlier where, where the people began to speak in other languages and, and then Peter stands up and he begins to preach the sermon and, and you put it all together and you begin to discover that what Luke is really wanting us to see, what he wants the church to remember and what he is so insistent that we not forget is that you and I as the church, as the body of Christ, have been given a power, a power to witness to Jesus Christ. Now why? Why is it so important that we remember this to Luke? Why is he so insistent that we not forget that, this aspect? Because Luke understands that when it comes to witnessing to your faith in Christ, it is not just as simple always as telling other people what you believe. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's that easy. But it's not always that easy. For example, Luke knows that sometimes, sometimes we might struggle with finding the right words to say to people. Now there are some things that are just easy to share with other people. If you're in the grocery store and somebody stops you and asks you where the milk is located, you don't have a problem sharing that, do you? No, uh, go down the aisle, turn to the left, it's all the way in the back left-hand corner in the refrigerated area, there you'll find it. No problem. If you're sitting in a group and the, the subject of favorite television shows comes up, you probably don't have much trouble telling somebody what your favorite television show is. That, that's, that's just easy enough to share, isn't it? But suppose for just a moment, suppose for just a moment you have a son or a daughter or son-in-law or daughter-in-law or grandchildren or parents or a brother or sister or, or, or a very close friend and, and faith is foreign to them. And you want to share with them. Do you struggle with that? Do you struggle with knowing exactly how to share it in a way that they will hear it? Well, sometimes some of us do. Not because we don't have faith. Not because we don't want to share the faith. But we want to make sure that we say it in a way that it will be heard. We want to, we want to share in a way that will reflect the intimacy and how profound this is in our own lives. I remember when our daughter Catherine was just three and a half years of age, I was serving the Sharp Memorial United Methodist Church up on the campus of Young Harris College up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And one night, I... Uh, had a meeting at the church, and so I was gone. And while I was gone, Carol and our daughter Catherine were in the den of our home, and, and they were watching, while I was gone, a Billy Graham crusade. Billy Graham crusade. And, uh, you know, Catherine was just kind of running around doing the things that Catherine always does. And, and uh, at one point, Billy Graham talked about inviting Jesus into your heart. And, and you know how kids, they always hear more than you think they're hearing. And so, so at one point, Catherine turned to Carol and she said, uh, Mama, 
how do I invite Jesus into my heart? Now, those of you that know Carol know that she is never at a loss for words. And so she just thought for a moment. She said, well, your dad will be home from his meeting in just a little while. He'll be able to tell you all about it. And so when I got home, I tried as best I knew how. I mean, how do you take something so profound and share it with some, uh, uh, with a three and a half year old? Carol tried as best she knew how. And the three of us knelt before the couch. And Catherine invited as much of Jesus as she understood at that moment into her heart. But I will tell you, I will tell you that it was difficult even for a preacher to know how to say it in a way that she would hear. Luke knew that sometimes you would need power for that sort of thing. He also knew that sometimes we would struggle with our own prejudices and our own baggage. This, you remember, was one of the, uh, the first contention, contentious issues that, that the church faced. Uh, most of Jesus', well, all of Jesus' earliest followers were, were Jewish. And, and, you know, and so when it came time to witness to, to the faith, of Jesus in Jerusalem and Judea, there was not that big of a problem. They, uh, they were friends. They looked like them. They acted like them. They thought like them. They ate like them. No problem here. But Jesus didn't just say you're to witness in Jerusalem and Judea. He said you're to witness in Samaria. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you sure you really want me to witness in Samaria? You don't know what they say of those people. You know how they're viewed. They're viewed as half-breed. Surely you don't really want me to witness to them. And then, he didn't just say in Samaria. He said to the rest of the world. And, and that's when the problems really started because that meant that they were to witness to the Gentiles and the Gentiles didn't look like them. They didn't think like them. They didn't act like them. They didn't eat like them. Surely, surely you don't mean that I am to love and care for people like that, people that are not like us, people who I don't even agree with on most things. Surely you don't mean that I'm to witness to them. And, and so the church struggled with this and they wrestled with this and they had a general conference over this and, and they talked about all of these different things and, and finally after they had argued and gone back and forth and back and forth, you remember what the church said? The church said yes. Yes. To be a witness for Jesus Christ means that you witness to everyone, everyone. And Luke said, to get over that kind of prejudice, to get over that kind of baggage, you're going to need a power that is beyond yourself. But perhaps most of all, I think Luke understood the difficulty of our getting over our feelings of inadequacy, inadequacy in sharing the, the message with other people. You, you see, sometimes it's not just a matter of finding the right words. It's not just a matter of getting over our own prejudices and our own baggage. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's that we know better than anybody else that we are not what God wants us to be. We know better than anybody else our own sins, our own failures, and our own mistakes, and we begin to wonder, who am I that I should carry a freight so valuable? Who am I that I should speak a word for the Almighty? Who am I that I should represent the Christ? The one, the one, the one who came and lived and died and then rose victoriously. If you've ever asked that question, I, I, I think it's probably safe to say that the early disciples wrestled with that question as well. In fact, I suspect... I don't know this for sure, but I suspect 
that in those moments before Peter stood up to preach his sermon on that very first Pentecost Sunday, I suspect he must have had that question in his mind. Who am I? Who am I? To stand before people who represent all the nations of the world. Who am I to stand up before these thousands of people, Acts tells us. I was the one who denied the Christ three times. Later, I suspect that the Apostle Paul found himself sometimes asking the question. Paul, you remember, was the one who was charged with the responsibility of carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. He was the one responsible for starting churches in all of these various different places. And I'm sure that there were times in the quiet of the night when he was alone with his own thoughts and, and he began to think, who am I that I should be doing this? I was the one who persecuted the church. It can be a bit frightening, can it? To be a witness for Jesus Christ is, is, is one of the primary tasks of being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. But still, it can be frightening. Of course, what Luke understood and what he wanted us to remember that is on the day of Pentecost, God gave us all the power we would ever need. He gave us all the power we would ever need to fulfill our task as followers of Jesus Christ. He gave us all the power we would ever need to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And Luke wanted us to know that like my father there, at the edge of Niagara Falls. God has his arm around us and he's whispering into our ear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I've got your back. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is the good news for this morning. Our gracious and loving God, Let it happen again. Let your church feel the power of your Holy Spirit as it flows through us. Remind us that even in the moments when we find it frightening to stand and share our faith, that you are standing alongside of us giving us all the power we will ever need. This is our prayer, and we pray it in the name of Christ our Lord.